Hello, my name is Guilherme and I am from Brazil. This is Conversations on Magic with Michael Close. Michael, can you... Hey, how are you? Thanks. Uh, happy to be here. There's something that uh, some people, because I appeared, I was the first Brazilian to appear on Fulas. Some other magicians sent me some videos of them doing some, some auditions to Fulas or mm -hmm. perhaps what they wanted to submit to Fulas. And there's one thing that uh, got to me, which is something that you mention a lot, and the other producers, the, the Larry and Andrew, also mentions uh, both uh, backstage and also outside in YouTube podcasts and so on, which is the goal of the um, of Fooler's itself is not to fool Penn and Teller, is to create entertainment, and then you have fooling Penn and Teller as an excuse to create this magic show and everything else. Yes. And that stuck to my mind for quite a while. And when I see the submissions, there's something that gets to me a lot, which is I see a lot of red herrings. Yes. Go ahead. And I don't feel comfortable with them, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know what yeah, they think. Uh, so we'll talk about this. Uh, I mean, there's lots of things to unpack in that, in, okay. in just in your initial discussion there. Okay. Um, you know, I understand completely uh, magicians' egos, and they feel like if they go on the show, then they need to have a trick that's going to fool Penn and Teller. Otherwise, other magicians won't think they're good magicians if they don't have something that fools them. Now, I, I say, well, I think it's absolutely great to have a trick that will fool Penn and Teller, but in order to do that, you need to come up with a trick that really... Uh, breaks a little bit of new ground, something that people really haven't seen before. Uh, things that are new, uh, you know, new to me or new to, um, uh, you know, because they, I mean, Penn started out as a juggler, but he's still quite a knowledgeable magician, as well as being a really smart guy. Teller has been in magic ever since he was a little kid, sort of like me. And he's a really smart guy. So he, they know a lot of stuff. What happens is magicians try to fool them with uh, by complicating a trick. So um, the idea of a red herring is, is that there's something about what you're doing that suggests a particular method, mm -hmm. which isn't actually the way that you do the trick, that you do it a different way. Now, in my experience, where this red herring idea comes from is what we in magic call a sucker trick. So, for example, a sucker trick would be there's a, 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 a trick that I saw when I was maybe six years old. And I remember it to this day being so badly fooled by it. Uh, they use sucker tricks a lot for children, for children's show, because they get all worked up and all excited because they think they've figured out mm. what the method is. So in this trick, the trick is called the hippity hop rabbits. It's a stand up trick, a platform trick. And it uses uh, two cutouts of rabbits, the shape of rabbits facing you. One is white, one is black, and two slides, two covers. They're just tubes, they're rectangular okay. tubes that go over the rabbits. And one has a black top hat and one has a white top hat. So the white one goes over the white rabbit, the black one goes over the black rabbit, and in the course of talking, the magician turns them around. So the white top hat is still here, the black top hat is still here, but he just turned them around. Now when he lifts the covers, the rabbits have changed places. And of course, this starts to get the kids all excited because now to make them go back, he turns it around again, lifts them up, and now, of course, the kids are going nuts and they're all saying, turn them around, turn them around, turn them around. So the magician turns the covers around. No, 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 turn the rabbits around. So then he holds them upside down this way. You, what, you want me to hold? No, 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 turn them around. So then he holds them close to his chest and he turns all the way around until they really get, you know, just going out of their minds. And then when he actually turns them around, there one is yellow and the other one is green. So here's what's happened. You've set up an apparent method for this trick. The method simply seems to be that they have the opposite color on the back. But at the end of the trick, 
you discover that's not the method at all. It must be something else. And now you're really fooled by it. I mean, that trick bothered me as a kid for a long, 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 long time. I, and the reason it bothered me for so long, it was an expensive trick. And I couldn't afford to buy the trick when yeah, I, was, you know, so. Um, but when you, the main thing that point I want to make about that is the red herring, which is the backs have opposite colors. That red herring is proved wrong. That's not the way the trick works at the end of the trick. That's the way the trick, you know, that's not the way the trick oh. works wrong. So that becomes a satisfying thing for the audience. I mean, they get fooled. And the problem with sucker tricks is you are really making them feel foolish for believing something that's wrong. Yeah. So it works okay for kids. It's kind of a teasing sort of a trick for kids. But when you take the red herring approach and you put it in a trick for fool us, what guys do is they'll come up with a trick and they'll have they'll they will make it seem like it could happen in one or two or three or four different ways and then it becomes a guessing game of well he could have done it this way this way this way and this way and the problem is unlike the hippity hop rabbits at the end of the trick you don't disprove the other three ways you don't show that that wasn't the way it worked so um Penn and Teller don't like red herrings in tricks and they don't like it because it sort of is not the nature of the game to say, well, there was 15 ways you could have done it and I picked the wrong one. That doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. But to, what I try to explain to the magicians is how unsatisfying that is for the people watching at home who are not magicians because let's face it, they're going to be trying to figure it out too. And they'll say to themselves, oh, he must have done this, or oh, maybe he could have done this, or he couldn't have done, he could have done this. And now at the end, the trick ends, and all of those methods are still possible. So there isn't any magic. They're, they're not fooled. Uh, you know, Johnny Thompson, uh, my great friend Johnny Thompson, who was uh, the magic consultant, uh, he and I did it together from seasons uh, two through five. Um, he used to use the phrase, you have to shut the door. Now, what this means is, if this seems like a possible method, then before the trick ends, I need to do something that proves to you that can't be the method. Tomaris calls it the theory of false solutions, that you have to eliminate the possibility of any method when you do a trick. And so that's why I, you know, I discourage these, the, uh, the red herrings when the guys do it. It's it's bad television. It's not satisfying magic particularly. And it really leaves the people who are watching, I believe, unsatisfied at the end of the trick. So we we try to get rid of those. It's just not too much fun. And you know, <coughs> there in many times when magicians try to fool each other, they will put red herrings in when you're trying to fool your friends. Well, Okay, fine. Um, usually, though, the the red herring gets, you know, gets disproved by the end of the trick. Um, for example, I have a method for doing the invisible deck trick, which is um, completely uses a completely normal deck. So that when I first started doing this, before magicians knew the kind of work I did and the fact that I do memorize deck tricks and things like that. Um, I would do what looked like the invisible deck and the card that was freely named would be the only card reversed in the middle of the deck, but then I could give them the deck because there was nothing wrong with it. So that's kind of a red herring thinking, oh, Mike's just doing the invisible deck. But at the end you go, wait a minute, this can't be the way I know how to do it. This is a normal deck. So that pays off at the end. Um, it's it's a real challenge as you work through things and and this is another aspect of doing magic that you have to think about is you have to think about well how else could this trick be done other than the way i'm doing it and not only hide the method you're using Shut but it. also close the doors on any other method that you might be that you might yeah. be. Um, and it's a challenge uh the best tricks 
for the most part, don't have that aspect. They they do not have the the red herring aspect. Yeah. I would guess you mentioned a lot about uh, the, the it being quite negative for foolers and for television, but. Uh... In the end, it just affects any magic, right? Even if I'm face to face with someone, yes. the experience is, oh, I think that's what that's what the person did. You lost that magical effect, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you can use a red herring, but, but before the trick ends, you have to show that's not the way the trick worked. Um, you know, sometimes it comes as a surprise ending. Uh, sometimes it's not so much a red herring. Uh, for a while, it was very popular. I think this came from uh, Shigeo Takagi, uh, a really wonderful Japanese uh, magician who died a few years back. Uh, but he would do a routine uh, with a ball and a cup, sort of like a cups and balls, but one cup and one ball. And at the end of the trick, after all this happened, he would show you that it wasn't a cup. It was a solid piece of wood. So the, the, the you know, the so now you go back and you uh, but that's almost more of a, a surprise kicker ending rather than a red herring and those things can be very effective i think those things can, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. things can be great fun um that's because you created a story during you who is watching it created a story of everything you are say, seeing and it's already amazing and at the end it's something completely different and it's even more amazing right right so you know when paul gertner was on on fool us the first time uh, he has a very famous trick that he uh, published years and years ago, and uh, it's one that I've done uh, at least 40 years, probably, maybe maybe more. But whenever I first heard about the idea, before maybe even made into print, because Paul and I are old friends. Uh, but it's the unshuffled trick, where the writing is on the side of the deck. And so what he thought was, well, if I go on Penn and Teller and I do this trick, they're going to know how this trick works. So he didn't add any red herrings into the trick. He added one extra climax at the end where the writing on the deck changed three times, not twice, changed three times. And this, of course, caught Penn and Teller completely by surprise. So that's not a red herring. That's an extra bonus effect. And it makes you go, how in the world did that work? You know, mm -hmm. and then they could and then he gave them the deck. To, to look at. And so it was a very satisfying moment for Paul. We spent, we spent, this is an example of, of me working with somebody who has been a pro for many, many, many years and still talking about ideas and, and me saying, well, you know, I don't think, I don't think that's going to work. I mean, Paul's idea was, his original idea was that he would do the regular unshuffled and then he'd switch the deck to do the third phase. And this is where sort of understanding how TV works. I said, you're going to have a very hard time getting away with that deck switch. You need to find some other way. And he did. And he did. I mean, there's the, there's the thing. If I hadn't said the deck switch won't work, maybe he would have been happy with that. So, you know, you have to keep uh, keep working on those things and keep pushing. Yeah. For, for those who want to read it, he made a blog post or several blog posts on his Full yes. appearance, his first and second, and he tells this story. He tells part of it and another part, and you're adding stuff that was not there. So it's it's very interesting. I read, I, I looked for all blog posts before submitting to Fullers. I read everything that I could, so I found his story there. And you mentioned the invisible deck version that you have. I believe it's the one from Workers One that, that uh, you have on the DVD. Workers, workers Five. Workers five, five, okay. So yeah. I got the DVD from Workers. I think, oh, perhaps it's the entire set. I don't know because there you do the invisible deck there, mm -hmm. and it's something very funny because uh, I I don't remember the recording saying that the audience perhaps is half magicians and half or ran, just random people yeah. because when you do the effect, half of the people laugh or half of the people says woo woo because the card is there, and then when you open the deck. The other half of the room says "Whoa!" Yes, and and that's the magician saying "Whoa!" Yes. That's the difference between the yeah, magicians. Two reactions. And... Two reactions. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and you actually you you emphasize that it's it's very it was very uh, impressive to see it. It's, it's well, one, you know, one day I'll do it. Um, this is a little off topic, but um, my mom said that she put me at, down at a piano when I was about four years old, and I would sort of plunk out things. I was not any 
child prodigy or anything like that, but I was kind of fascinated by it. And she played piano and was a church organist. So, um, you know, we had music going on in the house, but it's it, at age six um, is when I sort of five or six is when I started getting interested in magic and got my first tricks. And um, ever since I was a high school kid, I guess I probably, you know, 16, 17, something like that, I would play either in a restaurant or maybe a bar because I looked I was a little bit I looked like I was a little older than I was. And I just play solo piano background music, you know what I mean? And I I played with a band and what have you. And so then when music became my profession, I never wanted to do magic professionally because um, uh, I didn't want to have to make those compromises that you have to make when you do something you love as a job. There's things you're going to have to do that you wish you didn't have to do, but that's part of the job. So what the only thing that really interested me with magic was um, fooling other magicians. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to fool other magicians. That was fun for me. So that's when I started trying to find stuff that people didn't know, you know, and I talked to friends and I'd come up with crazy methods. We had a magic club in Lafayette, Indiana, which is where uh, Purdue University is. And I was there for a couple of years. And there was a group of magicians that met there uh, once a month. And so some guy would do a trick one month and then we'd all go home and try to figure out how to do that same trick to fool him the next time we got together. So it was very enjoyable. There were there were really uh, good and fun magicians involved in that group. Um, but when I started and, and the kinds of things I did would have those red herrings in them because I'm working for magicians. Uh, but once I started to do it professionally, working in a restaurant in 1978, I threw all that away because it, it wasn't satisfying. First of all, you have to be careful when you do a sucker trick for someone because you really are making them look like a foolish person. So you have to do it. It has to be done very gently uh, because if it isn't, then um, you can insult them and it becomes an unfriendly situation. Yeah. The, the first time that I did the effect with the piano that you saw, Mm -hmm. um, I did the te that little theater, that little play that my father is here and my father is complaining and etc. And and then people just say, let me shut down your microphone because everybody's listening to you argue with your father and so on. And it's funny for me, of course, because I know it's fake. But uh, when people realize it's an effect and when, when I finished the effect, then my father came to me later because he wasn't here, right? Uh, later, he came to me and he said, oh, I watched it. But I feel perhaps the people that are watching it won't feel good about it because they were, they will feel like they were, they, they were played with, right? Yeah. I, I was just making fun of them or something like that, although it's not a goal. And so I'll, I'm thinking about changing this part so I don't, so they don't get this, this feeling, right? It's yeah. just about the, the effect itself. And uh, so we spoke about the, the invisible invisible deck. Um, and also everything that you're talking also explains to me, now I have an, a reason why in some effects on Fullers, at the end of the effect, some of the magicians say, oh, and here you can see that I have this thing here. And they say something which actually is just closing one door. And uh -huh. It's very obvious that they're just, I think the last appearance from Paul, he, he, he did something like that. He, at the end, he says, oh, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking these, 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 and that. And no, I did not do this. I did not do that. I did not do this and that. Yes. He closes those doors. He shuts yeah. those doors. Right. And yeah, I, I remember. And it happens perhaps not that often, but I remember a few times that I, I've seen that. Yeah. And another connection, which is not exactly, but it's something that you came up with uh, during this conversation, is you mentioned the rabbit's, um, the rabbit's effect, mm -hmm. the, the true rabbit. And I saw it those days in a, it was the birthday of, of a friend of my cousin and there was a magician online and I watched it and, and he did something like that. It was, uh, it was probably two rabbits and, or two, two animals and he would change, switch, do something with the animals and at the end the animals were different, right? And you mentioned with kids it works and perhaps it's another conversation, but let's see. Um, and it's something that for me it works. I was so happy and entertained that that okay, it's obvious that that's the effect. 
while I was watching it, it's obvious that that's what he wants us to think, us adults and children to think. Right. But he will have something at the end that will show me that's not the the, the effect. You were so, so I, yeah, I was waiting for that, but that did not. And that's the point that I want to talk about. It did not. It did not kill the pleasure of enjoying him performing it. I was still enjoying it because he was having fun showing it. Children were saying, "Oh, turn it around," and and I was enjoying watching everything happening. And and I could not. I, I have no idea what's what what he was doing there. I don't think I have. I don't remember exactly what it was. He wasn't uh, doing the way you mentioned. It was some other method, perhaps. And and I have no idea what he did. And I still don't want to know what he did because I'm not going to use it. So I don't want to know. I'm happy not knowing it. Yeah. And and that's that's something that I want to say. Uh, I hear a lot that magicians, uh, and I think Tamariz even says that that we lose the ability to enjoy magic sometimes because we are going to learn how things work behind the scenes right. so that we can provide this magic experience to other people. And then that's that we are very happy as magicians when other magicians come to us and provide this experience. And and it seems to me that it's obvious another conversation, but why not? And I I do at least perhaps because I'm a beginner at this, it's I do feel like I can still enjoy it, even though perhaps I know the methods or perhaps I don't know the methods. It, I can still just open my heart and watch it. Even if it's a magician doing effects, simple effects to children, and not that all effects to children are simple, of course, but even if it's a simple effect to a child, I can still open my heart and just say, oh, let's watch it. Let me watch it as, as I'm supposed to watch it and not as a magician. Let me watch and enjoy it. And I can still enjoy it. And, and that's something that's, that I like. I don't know, it's just something because you mentioned that adults will lose this ability also. You're absolutely right. I mean, that is one of the things that uh, that gets lost because, you know, I still have such fond memories of going into the magic shop uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where a uh, shop owned by my friend Dick Stoner, who's still around. I think he's almost 90 and, and an excellent, excellent magician. He's worked as a trade show magician and all kinds of things. He was the one I saw do the hippity hop rabbits when I was six years old at my school. Anyway, um, you know, and I'd go into the magic shop, you know, as a kid, you know, what's new? What's new? What do you got? Well, have you seen this one? Holy smoke. I remember seeing the trick about wild card for the first time. And I just couldn't believe it. And and the chop cup, the first time I saw it, when the big balls come out at the end, I was flabbergasted. And you you lose that over time because you find out how things work, which for me is one of the great delights. Uh, on Fool Us is when I hit somebody who has an idea that I had never, ever occurred to me, something I'd never seen before. That fills me with great joy. Um, what, what you end up happen, what end up, what ends up happening is that in order to feel that again, you have to feel it through the expression and the reaction of the people you're working for. Okay. Because when you give them that experience and you do it well, the look in their faces when it seems like everything they knew about how the world works doesn't make sense now, you can get uh, the word in English we use is vicariously. You know, I experience even even though it's happening to you, I can see that. And that gives me great joy to be able to, you know, recapture a little of this because I remember my own memory from it. Um, but the... Um, you know that being able to do that is really the great uh it's why you have to you know magic really only as a hobby uh, you need other people when you do magic i mean you know for me there's no magic i know how all this stuff works uh, it's not mysterious and astonishing and amazing to me because i know what's behind the curtain so the only way i can get that experience is to provide the astonishment for the people watching and it's a challenge, but it's it's really rewarding when you when you can do that for someone. Um, you know, uh, you were sort of uh, almost on the edge of talking about the magician in trouble uh, thing there yeah. for a second. Uh, you know, the thing about the hippity hop rabbits uh, is that kind of a trick 
is it isn't like the magician made a mistake. You know, he didn't make a mistake. He did the trick just the way he was supposed to do it. He just didn't expect you to figure it out so quickly. And so it doesn't look like that he's in trouble, that the, you know, the trick is, going. it just looks like he got caught. And then of course it, ha it happens at the end. Um, that is a very difficult thing to do convincingly. Uh, you know, when I see a magician who, who, you know, borrows a ring and it disappears, where did it go? I don't know where it goes, you know, and, and you have that. Well, everybody in the audience is pretty damn convinced that that ring is going to show up someplace at the end of the trick and everything will be fine. Yeah. yeah. Spectator, you have a dollar bill and, or whatever, and it gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. Well, you're pretty positive it's going to be coming back. And the main reason for that is that nobody does the acting properly to make me think that it really worked. Because think about it. Suppose I'm, I'm doing a thing and I borrow somebody's $20 bill and I accidentally somehow destroy it. I mean, that's not the trick. I just, all of a sudden it's gone. What's the first thing I would do? I'd take a $20 bill out of my wallet and I'd give it back to the guy and we'd go on because it would it would be horrible you know it, it would look like it, but you never really see anything that makes you think this trick wouldn't work you know it's it's really kind of an interesting thing uh i have a couple routines that have that in it but it's it's played a little more lighthearted um you know it's one way to to do it is there's a very very good trick it's also a Vernon trick again, uh, and it's again in one of the Vernon Chronicles uh, books. Those are fantastic, by the way. Uh, you can get them. Uh, to try to find a hard copy is going to cost you a lot of money on the secondary market, but they are available as PDFs uh, from l, l Publishing, and they're fantastic books. They're just great. And there's a trick in there called the fingerprint trick. And this is a trick in which it looks like you've made a mistake. But it's possible to play it realistically because you're not supposed to realize you've made the mistake. So you're in trouble, but you don't know you're in trouble. And then at the end of the trick, the card that you say is theirs and isn't, uh, apparently you've gone past their card. They've seen it, and now it's on the table, and it's gone. And now you come to this card, and you say, ah, oh, yeah, that's the one with the thumbprint. Very good. This is yours. And they say no, and now you show it, and it is. So you get that surprise. It's kind of a sucker trick, but you're not playing it, you know, too much like that. It's it, it, so, and I have, I've added some acting and a little more realism to the thing. Um, so, but it's a very delicate, it's a very delicate balance there. It's a very, you got to be careful how you play. And uh, you gave the example about the dollar bill and so on. And the first thing you would do would actually to replace the dollar bill because yeah, yeah you don't want to spend the money of another person so have you ever uh, i just got the idea probably someone already did it it's not my style but have you seen any magician do it just okay let me start my show okay please give me a five dollar bill and then the person puts fire and says oops it didn't work and just give a five dollar bill back to the person and i mean that's part of the show it's not no i've never a mistake they yeah. just make it in a, com in a fun yeah. way i don't know how to make it in a fun way but <laughs> yeah i've never seen anybody do that uh, there's a fellow named uh, Steve Mayhew who lives in, um, I think he's in Seattle, Seattle or Portland. He lives in the, the Pacific Northwest, the far northwestern corner of the United States. And he has a very funny gag uh, that he's going to get somebody to volunteer to do a trick, but it's going to be a random volunteer. Okay. So he takes uh, six $1 bills. And he rolls them up into a ball and drops them in a glass in a cup and a hundred dollar bill. And he rolls it up and he drops it in the glass and he shakes them up. And then he throws all the bills out into the audience. And now he says, if a bill came near, grab it, open it up. Whoever caught the hundred dollar bill, come on up. And nobody, come up. up. <laughs> and nobody comes up. And it's really funny. Uh, it's really funny. And then a little later on in his show, he says, uh, I'd like to borrow a $100 bill. Nobody 
He says, I know one of you out there has $100. <laughs> and the method was, is he really quite simple? All he does is when he crumbles up the 100, he switches it for a $1 bill. And it's so it costs him $7 to do the trick, but it's a great laugh. Perfect. It's really funny. Okay. Yes. But no, I've never seen anybody uh, destroy something and then uh, pay them right back and, and move on. Um, yeah. You know, it's because you see what happens. You know, one, a very popular trick for magicians is to do the uh, ring flight trick, you know, where the ring vanishes and ends up on your keychain, you know, hanging okay. from your keychain. And uh, I, I refuse to do that trick. I mean, I have done it. I've never done it with a ring with a gemstone. I published my version in one of the workers book. It's based on Gaten Bloom's uh, handling. Gaten doesn't use a reel. A reel, of course, is a thing that retracts, you know. And, and so basically that ring is being whipped around the back of your body by a, by a uh, you know a spring bloated thing that sends it back there and i i've you know there have been all kinds of stories when you get the ring back and they look at it and they go that's not my ring mm. you go these are fake diamonds mine were real diamonds so you know you or when they get it back one of the gems is gone got knocked out in the flight you know stuff like that so <laughs> there you really have magician in trouble you know and they're all you're on the ground <laughs> trying to find yeah. yeah, I've heard horror stories about that trick. I, I so I don't go near it. I don't go near it at all. It's too dangerous for me. Yeah, yeah. You quickly get sued. Oh yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Fun. yeah. 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 Not fun. Okay, yeah. Michael. Thank you very much. I think it was oh, very I, helpful I, again. Yeah. One more quick story. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the, a well-known magician was working in Las Vegas, and. Uh, his act involves stealing watches. So as he's going out in the audience and getting volunteers and what have you, he's taking people's watches. So at the end of the show, the last guy who helped him as he walks off stage, he says, oh, by the way, here, you want your watch back? And the guy goes, oh, my gosh, you know, he takes it back. And then he reaches in his case where he got all these other watches he stole, like five or six of them. And he goes, and if your watch is up here, maybe you want to get yours as well. And, and now he puts them down. And so people come running up. They get the watches. They leave. And one guy walks up and goes, where's my watch? Uh, he says, what? He goes, you, you held up my watch. I came up to get it. Where is it? Well, some unscrupulous person <laughs> ran up on stage, grabbed the watch, and took off. So, you know, it's... If these things happen. Yeah. That's the real yeah. thing in trouble. Oh, well, that's real. That's not. A, it's not a. It's not a stooge. Not a oh, I thought it was a stooge. Okay, it's not. <laughs> well, no, somebody really. Oh, the show that's was bad. The show was done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, it was tough. It was tough. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine it happened just once. I don't know. It yeah. would be too luck to happen just once. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Okay, the 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 seven five the seven one dollar view is better than this yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that's better. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. It was very helpful. And I hope people enjoy. Do you have any any last words you want to no, say? No, no, no. Thanks for having me. Uh, I enjoy these conversations. They're a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Let's meet together to the next conversation. Very good. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you for listening to this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. See you next time. But don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts on the subject in the comments area below. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.